A day on Venus lasts 243 Earth days, but spending a day there is almost like spending a day in hell. Despite being farther from the Sun than Mercury, Venus is hotter than Mercury. It is the hottest planet in the solar system. Imagine volunteering for a manned mission to Venus in the 1970s. You were able to determine from previous unmanned missions that Venus's atmosphere is dense and extremely hot. The insulation, parachute systems, and deceleration modules of the landing module were manufactured to the highest standards, and somehow you managed to land on Venus's surface. The maximum time you would survive on Venus would be about two hours, that is, if you were inside the landing module. Venus, the goddess of love, beauty, and nature in Roman mythology, is, on the contrary, a veritable hell with its extreme heat, pressure, and acidic atmosphere. When you observe it with the Hubble Space Telescope, you can only see its outer layers and clouds. Unlike Mars, it is impossible to see its surface. In fact, Mars' atmosphere is so thin that in 1877, astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli claimed to have seen channels on the Martian surface despite his limited resources. In the 1900s, astronomers thought that Venus might have a warmer, tropical climate because it is closer to the Sun than Earth. However, the most reliable information we have about Venus comes from the Soviet Union's Venera project. During the Cold War, when the space race was heating up and all attention was focused on journeys to the Moon and Mars, the Soviet Union was secretly conducting a Venus mission in the background. The first space probe sent in 1961, Venera 1, malfunctioned just a few days after launch and was lost before reaching Venus. Most people believe that Venera 7 was the only spacecraft capable of landing on the surface of Venus. However, by 1985, 10 probes had successfully landed on the surface of Venus. In addition, 13 Venera probes were able to transmit data from Venus's atmosphere back to Earth. In fact, the Venera missions demonstrated how far ahead and determined the Soviet Union was in the space race. Launched in 1965, Venera 3 failed to land successfully on Venus's surface, but at least it became the first man-made object to hit the surface of another planet. Just think about it. Sending a spacecraft built with 1966 technology to a planet 41 million kilometers away from Earth with a surface temperature hot enough to melt lead. Truly a great achievement for humanity. In fact, the rockets that launched both the U.S. and Russian first space probes were based on designs derived from the Nazis' V-2 rockets. The Venera probes were also launched using R-7 rockets inspired by the V-2. The first space probes were usually launched in pairs. This was because it was hoped that if one failed, the other could continue the mission. Does this sound familiar? Although they had different objectives, NASA's Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecraft also employed the same backup logic. Venera 4, launched in 1967, was the first spacecraft to successfully enter Venus's atmosphere. However, this success was short-lived. Due to Venus's dense atmosphere and high temperatures, it lost many of its systems even before entering the atmosphere. Nevertheless, it detected that the atmosphere was 96% carbon dioxide and that temperatures near the surface were extremely high. This led to a decline in the belief that life could exist on Venus. This was because Venus, with its heavy gases and sulfuric acid clouds, did not have a tropical climate as previously thought. Furthermore, although temperatures in the upper layers of the atmosphere were similar to those on Earth, they rose to 475 degrees as one descended toward the surface. 
Venera 4's fragile structure could not withstand the pressure and heat any longer and stopped transmitting signals after 93 minutes while still in the atmosphere. Actually, the Soviet Union wasn't the only country studying Venus. Of course, the U.S. made important discoveries about Venus without landing on it in the 1960s and 1970s with missions such as Mariner 2, Mariner 5, and the Parker Solar Probe. However, due to the inhospitable conditions on the planet, it almost stopped its Venus missions in the early 1980s and began to focus on other planets with a greater possibility of life. The Soviet Union's exploration of Venus continued stubbornly after Venera 4. In 1969, the Venera 5 and Venera 6 probes were launched with slightly modified designs and reinforced bodies. Like Venera 4, both probes operated for about 90 minutes and then stopped transmitting signals. The Soviet Union's passion for exploring Venus grew with each Venera probe taking one step further. However, much more radical solutions were needed for landing on the surface. Remember that the 90 atmosphere pressure on Venus's surface is equivalent to the pressure at a depth of approximately 900 meters in Earth's oceans. Nuclear submarines could barely reach that depth in the 1960s. Of course, submarines on Earth are not exposed to the high temperatures and acidity that the Venera probes were subjected to. The Venera 7 probe was supposed to land on the surface of Venus. The Soviets' goal was to understand why Venus resembled a dead planet by conducting surface temperature, pressure, and surface studies. It was equipped with a series of devices, including a temperature sensor, barometer, and light intensity meter, which were also present in other Venera probes. It would also transmit the data it collected to Earth via radio signals. Venera 7 had solar panels to meet its energy needs and batteries to store energy. Since Venus's atmosphere is very thick, it was very difficult for sunlight to reach Venera 7. Therefore, the batteries were vital for keeping the systems active. Here's a piece of information. While the Voyager's energy was supplied by a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, Venera 7 operated on solar energy. The most important reason for not using a radioisotope thermoelectric generator in the Venera missions was that these missions were known to be short-lived. This is because no Venera probe survived longer than 127 minutes. Soviet scientists knew they needed to build a more durable space probe to learn about the possibility of past life on Venus, Earth's closest neighbor, and to explore the surface beneath its thick atmosphere layer, which reached 250 kilometers. To this end, they enclosed the instruments and systems within a protective titanium sphere. This would prevent the measuring instruments from being crushed under 90 atmospheres of pressure and protect them from high temperatures. Furthermore, titanium's resistance to chemical corrosion would shield Venera 7 from Venus's acidic atmosphere. However, the most important problem to be solved here was the potential malfunctions in the landing system. Remember that Venera 3 failed to land on the planet's surface and crashed. How would this be overcome? The solution found by Soviet scientists was a difficult but effective method involving critical engineering calculations. They aimed to safely reduce the probe's speed using Venus's dense atmosphere and parachute systems. This approach was the most appropriate solution given the technology and resources available at the time. The atmosphere was so dense that using it for descent was the only option. Venera 7 was launched from the Baikonur Space Center on August 17, 1970. After a journey of approximately four months, it entered Venus's atmosphere on December 15, 1970. The parachute opened at an altitude of approximately 60 kilometers above the surface. 
the initial 1.8 square meters parachute deployed to gradually slow Venera expanded to 2.5 square meters 13 minutes later as designed when the connecting cables melted. Six minutes later, something unexpected happened. The parachute became completely inoperable due to Venus's harsh conditions. Venera 7 hit the surface at a speed of 16.5 meters per second. After the impact, it probably bounced off the surface and rolled over. What is surprising here is that Venera 7, which hit the surface at such a high speed, was still functioning after landing. This is because it was able to send some signals, albeit weak, after the impact. But remember, Venus's atmosphere is much like oceans, so even though the space probe hit at this speed, it was able to continue operating for a while longer. Despite all these challenges, Venera 7's Venus adventure lasted only 23 minutes. Of course, during this time, it partially fulfilled its mission and was able to send back some basic data about the planet's structure and temperature conditions. The Soviet Union's passion for exploring Venus continued obsessively. Therefore, in 1972, it sent Venera 8. Like previous probes, it performed a series of heat, temperature, and pressure measurements before remaining operational on the surface for 50 minutes. However, the Soviet Union had no intention of giving up. The landing procedures were reviewed, the body was thickened, heat insulation was increased, and the electronic protection systems were strengthened. Parachutes alone were not sufficient for landing on Venus. Therefore, the design was changed, and the shock-absorbing system was reinforced so that the space probe could function after free fall. The shock-absorbing legs at the bottom of the titanium sphere containing the instruments served to reduce the shock of impact. In addition, an aerodynamic shield and braking system in the form of a ring was located at the top of the sphere. This speed-reducing ring was a clever solution to slow down in the Venusian atmosphere, which behaves more like water than air. The most important discovery made by Venera 8 was that sufficient sunlight still reached the surface of Venus despite the dense cloud cover. Based on this, a camera was installed on Venera 9, resulting in a new space probe with a takeoff weight of 5 tons, and the expected day arrived. If Venera 9 could land successfully, the surface of another planet would be imaged from such close proximity for the first time. On October 20, 1975, the lander separated from the orbiter, and on October 22, Venera 9's deceleration parachutes opened at an altitude of 50 kilometers above the surface. Then, thanks to its deceleration ring, it was able to hit the ground at a speed of 7 meters per second. Everything went according to plan. The measurement systems kicked in and the cameras opened. Venera 9 communicated with us for 53 minutes and sent us something very important before falling silent. This historic photograph is the first photograph ever taken of the surface of Venus. This black and white photograph shows scattered piles of rocks. Similar photographs began to arrive from the subsequent space probes, Venera 10 and 11. On a planet like Venus, with such harsh conditions, it is extremely difficult for space probe cameras not to break, to be able to transmit data, and to open the lens remotely. Several more surface landings and orbital measurements were made until the last Venera 16 probe was launched in 1983. The first color surface photographs taken by Venera 13 in 1981 are particularly worth seeing. The saw-like metal protrusions visible in the photograph were made to make the landing harder and safer. Look, the surface of Venus appears flat and rocky. It doesn't seem like we are in a place that is very foreign to us. It looks almost like a place on our Earth. It seems as if peace and quiet reign around us. 
But is Venus really a quiet place? These sounds were recorded by Venera 13. Now, for the first time, you will hear a sound recording taken from another planet. I likened these sounds to rain and wind. What do you think these sounds resemble? Experiments conducted on the soil samples collected by Venera 13 and Venera 14 revealed that the surface is largely composed of rock, volcanic material, and possibly some minerals. What really makes me wonder is that during the Cold War, the US showed little interest in Venus while the Soviet Union obsessively spent its resources on exploring Venus. For example, today China is putting a lot of effort into bringing the large amounts of helium-3 found on the Moon to Earth. But in the 1970s, even if the Soviet Union had found a valuable mineral there, it lacked the technology to bring it to Earth. Economic factors were also a key factor in the collapse of the Soviet Union alongside perestroika and glasnost. I believe that large and expensive space missions like the Venera program can also be cited as one of the reasons for the deterioration of the Soviet Union's economy during this period. But despite everything, achieving such dazzling successes in space under the primitive conditions of that era is truly commendable. In the end, we didn't find tropical rainforests and reptiles on Venus, but thanks to the space race of the 1970s, we at least have some idea about Venus. Also, what do you think about this? Please share your thoughts with me in the comments section. Our channel is still very new and needs your support as much as possible. See you soon.